So uh, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the second seminar uh, in our virtual series um, with uh, John Dylan Haynes and Walter Sinat Armstrong. And it's moderated by Christina Kreisich. Uh, the first one uh, that we had about a month ago was by Patrick Haggard and Richard Houghton, moderated by Elizabeth Perez. And we'll have uh, another one um, next month with uh, Adina Roskis and Aaron Scherger. Uh, it'll be on the readiness potential. And it will be moderated by Tomas uh, Dominique. Um, and I think uh, we can let uh, Christina take it from here. All right, thank you. Um, yes, I'm Christina Krasich. I am a postdoc at Duke University in uh, the United States, and I will be moderating today's event. So it is with much pleasure that I introduce our speakers today, John Dylan Haynes and Walter Sinnott Armstrong. John is a professor for theory and analysis of large scale brain signals, as well as the director of the Berlin Center for Advanced Neuroimaging. Walter is a Chauncey Stillman Professor of Practical Ethics in the Department of Philosophy and the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke. The seminar today will have the following structure. It has changed a few times, so hopefully I have it right. Um, John will present first and will allow for a very brief Q&A after his talk. Walter will then present, followed by another very brief Q&A. But then afterwards, we'll open it up to more general discussion and questions. So if you have a question or comment at any time, please type it into the chat function, because that's what I will use to uh, pick which question will be asked during the brief question and answer. And then during the larger question and answer session, um, I will again use that chat function uh, to try to get to as many questions and comments as possible during that time. So we hope that the structure will encourage lively conversation, um, but of course remain courteous to others. If we don't get to your question or comment during the, the scope of the time, I'm sure the speakers will be, uh, will welcome them after the talk. So um, if there's, uh, we, we are expecting today's seminar to last about 90 minutes, but if there's no other sort of uh, preliminary discussions, then we'll go ahead and get started uh, with John. Um, with their seminar entitled Responsibility Without Freedom. So, John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hey, thanks, Christina. Thanks, Uri, and hi, Walter. Um, hi, hi, everyone else. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is not primarily about the brain, but it's about some other work we were doing and where I've been discussing a lot with um, particularly Walter who has diagnosed me as a semi-compatibilist. So it's uh, one of the nicest diagnoses I've ever received so far uh, from a professional philosopher. And um, I'll add it to my long list of diagnoses. Um, but what I wanna start off with is, um, I just wanna tell you a little bit about the background of the work we've been doing um, on this topic, on uh, lay concepts of free will and responsibility. Um, so, as some of you might know, uh, my research group has for quite a few years been following up on studies like Libet's and Haggard and Eimer's uh, and so on, um, looking into signals in the brain that happen before people make subjectively free choices. So you're in a situation where there are two alternatives for you to choose from you feel that there's no strong motive to pick one or the other. It feels more or less random that you pick one or the other. And we look in the brain and we see that we can predict these choices in the EEG a few hundred milliseconds, in the fMRI a few seconds before people think they're making up their mind. And you can tell a long story about this, and I'm sure you've all heard many variants on this before. Um, but I want to pick up on uh, a specific topic. So what I don't want to talk about is what I normally talk about, which is this topic here, which is, do these experiments identify deterministic causes of our subjectively free decisions? So, I mean, I guess the basic idea of these limit experiment style studies is that you say, like, well, wow, this is when you 
think you're making up your mind, but actually there was a cause prior to that. So you might not have been free at the point in time when you felt you were making up your mind, like the, the dice were cast uh, earlier. I don't want to talk about that. And the reason I don't want to talk about that because I think it's boring. Uh, and I think it's boring because uh, just if I were to just cite one study from our lab by uh, Schultz Kraft and others, I think our experiments basically don't kind of look backwards and say that um, we can identify deterministic causes of our decisions from prior brain signals. So I, I think uh, this is kind of interesting. I think the Libet style of experiment when it comes to the specific question like, can we predict a choice a few hundred milliseconds or a few seconds before it occurs? I think that alone is a, actually a dead end. Um, now, the general question though is whether the kinds of decisions that people study here uh, these seemingly indifferent decisions where you're given two buttons, a left and a right button, um, or you're given a time point when you can move or something like that, whether these are good examples of free decisions. And I'm leaving out the kind of question here whether good examples for philosophers or which flavor of philosopher or for lay people. So uh, are these good John, examples of... John, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, did you have slides you'd like to share with everybody? You don't see the slides? No, no, sorry about that. We oh just... my God, you don't see the slides. Okay, I have to, this is just, uh, here we go. You can't, you didn't see all my beautiful slides. Can you see this slide now? Yes, now we see them. Thank okay, you. brilliant. So this was the first slide, you didn't miss out much there. Um, so we have these choice predictive brain signals. They don't identify the diversity causes, but are they good examples of decisions? And I think there are two questions that I want to address here. One is, well, aren't people making up their mind when they, decide to participate in the experiments like in a prospective sense uh, and another question I want to ask is like well these decisions are more or less uh, decisions where people are indifferent about the alternatives uh, shouldn't we be rather looking at reason-based decisions if we really want to study free will now um, the reason I engage in this work with a PhD student Robert Deutschlander was because um, people just kind of kept voicing all these very strong opinions about well, we all know that free will is when you base your decisions on reasons rather than indifference and things like that. So I thought, well, let's look what lay people say about this. And I think there are good reasons to look at lay judgments. I, I don't think they're kind of particularly relevant for the philosophical debate. Uh, so of course you can define a technical term irrespective of what lay people think, uh, believe, how they define a concept. But it's interesting when it comes to free will, I think, because we want our um, concepts to be somehow intuitive, certainly if we want to, them to influence, uh, 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 say, legal um, uh, definitions. So I'm gonna address the key questions, so three main questions. So first of all, do lay people consider uh, action choices and limit experiments as free? So is this a typical scenario where lay people would say, yeah, I think that's a free decision when you kind of decide when you want to move or decide between a left and a right button. Um, because it's kind of like difficult to study this in the absolute, we're going to ask in a slightly different way, which is delay people consider choices for actions as more free when they involve deliberation and motives and reasons, than when they're spontaneous and don't involve reasons. Um, the second question we can deal with very briefly, are distal intentions considered more relevant for freedom than proximal intentions? And third, is there evidence that lay people dissociate between freedom and responsibility, which is a direct handover to Walter's part of the talk? So, um, the first study was done with Robert Deutschlander and Michael Pound, and I'm the philosophical layperson here. Um, so, the first study we had three parts. Um, so, um, the f we had a couple of factors. So, we had the vignettes, and you can, of course, spend until the end of days discussing whether vignettes are a good way to probe people's intuitions, whether they're complex enough, or they're too complex, whatever. Um, and in the first study, 1A, we studied the factors of intentions and awareness. So, basically, we gave people descriptions of simple uh, uh, decisions people were making. And we manipulated whether people had an intention to perform the action, whether they were indifferent with respect to the action, or whether they had an opposing intention, and whether they'd consciously thought about it or they hadn't consciously thought about it. And we also looked at this for two different intentions just to make sure this wasn't specific to the intention we chose. Just to give you an example. So here's a decision uh, uh, vignette. Susan sits in the kitchen on the table in front of her. She discovers an unknown book of her roommate. 
she consciously realizes that she wants to read the book. So there's consciousness and wants to means she kind of has an intention. She opens the book and starts reading. So we can now do variants of this. We can, for example, change the action. Now we have Matthew, he's sitting in front of a glass of water and he grabs a glass and starts drinking the water. So just a different action. And I'm not gonna be talking about the actions anymore because everything we found didn't, wasn't really modulated by the action itself. So the second factor is conscious versus unconscious. So when we manipulate the conscious, so from conscious to unconscious, um, Susan's sitting in the kitchen, she discovers an unknown book, but now without anything in mind, she opens the book and starts reading, only after which she consciously realizes that she wanted to read the book all the time. We could discuss kind of the reality of these um, uh, uh, vignettes uh, separately. But this is the unconscious version. So at the point in time when she started the action, she hadn't thought about her intention before. Now, another is when she's indifferent. So she doesn't have an intention. She doesn't want to read the book, but she's indifferent to whether she wants to read the book, but she still reads it anyway. And another one is an opposing intention where she consciously realized that she does not want to read the book, but she still reads it anyway, which I guess everyone has experienced that before. Um, so these are the results. What you can see here is a slightly busy uh, plot, but what you can see here on the uh, y-axis are the freedom ratings on a Likert scale from one to five. And we have the three different intention conditions, which is they had an intention to perform the action. They were indifferent with respect to the action. They had an opposing intention, so they didn't want to do it. And then we have the two actions, action one, action two. We can basically ignore these. And we had a conscious condition and an unconscious condition. So I'm going to simplify this somewhat by collapsing the conditions. So this is the effect of consciousness. So what you can see here is that the most free case is when you have an intention to do it and you're aware of that intention. But this doesn't seem to quite play such a role when it comes to imposing intention. So that doesn't seem to matter. So this like the really super duper free intention is the conscious pl consciousness plus intention condition. So second, the question is, what about, um, does it matter if you have an intention versus you don't really care or you don't have an opposing intention? This is quite interesting. So what we found was that it doesn't really seem to matter that much whether people had an intention or they were just indifferent, as long as they didn't have an intention to do something different, they do the opposite. Um, and this is something we could discuss. Um, and in a second experiment, we then went more to something that is probing into the um, idea of reason-based views of, of free will. So now um, we added the following factors. We now had deliberation versus spontaneity, choosing versus picking, and consequences versus no consequences. And I'll explain these uh, uh, separately here. So now we have slightly different uh, scenarios because we needed to include reasons uh, in these scenarios. So Matthew looks for a new long-term job. He's gotten two job offers. He's received contracts to sign. The job conditions are very different. So that points towards choosing, not just picking. Matthew deliberates which job would be better. So he's deliberating. He doesn't just spontaneously decide. And only after careful consideration, he decides for a job and signs one contract. So he's, he has a consequence. He's signing a job contract. So if we start varying this, we can now add from deliberation, we can go from deliberation to spontaneity. So now um, uh, the Matthew doesn't deliberate which job will be better, he just spontaneously decides. Or we change uh, from choosing to picking, or we say the job conditions are different, we replace that with the job conditions are identical. So the choosing between two identical jobs. And finally, we're looking at consequence versus no consequence situations. Only after careful consideration, he decides and takes one pen. So he has to make a very unimportant uh, decision here. And what we find is quite striking. If you believe that reasons and motives are key um, defining criteria for um, free will, um, this flies exactly in your face. So it seems the decision for an action is considered more free when you actually act spontaneously, or you decide spontaneously when you're picking. So when there is no true difference between your alternatives, and when the decision doesn't have a consequence. So this is, in my eyes, exactly the opposite of what you would expect if you believe that motivation, deliberation, reasons, and these things are key to defining whether an action is free or not. And finally, we looked at the issue of distal versus proximal intentions because of this classic argument that uh, while the decisions in a limit experiment are not free, but 
the, the free will occurs when you decide to participate in the experiment or not. So we have these scenarios where we say on Monday, Anne has the intention to go out for brunch with her friends on Saturday. So this is like five days ahead of time. On Saturday, she also intends to go out and brunch with her friends. Afterwards, she meets up with her friends for brunch. So this is the proximal intention and we have the distal intention. And you could ask, well, which of these is more relevant for freedom rating? So we give people these kind of scenarios and we vary the proximal and the distal intentions, distal intentions. What you find is the distal intention doesn't make any difference. The only thing that's relevant for the freedom rating is your proximal intention. And when you kind of have a proximal intention to do the action, your freedom rating is highest. When you're indifferent, it's in the middle. And when you're opposed, it's the lowest. So you can see that um, here, there is actually also a difference between indifference and uh, intention as well. So um, I'd say, uh, if we just summarize this, it suggests that the kind of decisions that are made in limit experiments um, and, or other experiments where people kind of are choosing between seemingly spontaneously choosing between very similar conditions actually capture lay intuitions about freedom quite well. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to kind of um, uh, salvage the, the limit experiment here because I think it's a heroic experiment. We've done stuff on this topic as well, but I, I, don't, I don't really think it's relevant anymore for other reasons. But the reason is not because these are not decisions that lay people would consider free. So people have strong freedom in so then we had a visitor here in Berlin, uh, Till Fierkant, and I also got speaking to uh, Walter about this topic. And uh, we were discussing this issue that, well, this is all very nice if you ask people about free will, but what if you ask them about responsibility? Um, and Till made this prediction. He said, I think it'll be very different if you ask them about responsibility. So we, with Robert Deutschland, with a PhD student, and Walter, uh, we went on and we, we just did the study. And what we found was quite interesting. So we repeated the, the previous experiments, and now we've got deliberating versus spontaneity, choosing versus picking, so basically difference versus no difference between the alternatives, and consequence or no consequence. And now we do this in two different conditions. One condition is where people are asked to rate freedom, whether the action is free. And the other is when people are asked to act, judge whether people are responsible for the action. And we did this in two separate groups because we didn't want to prime the freedom ratings by the responsibility ratings and vice versa. So there are two separate groups that were studied here. And what we find is something interesting. That is, let's first look at the interesting case. When you look at spontaneity, freedom and responsibility judgments are comparable. I, I don't think the absolute scale means very much here. But what you see is an opposing effect if when you go from spontaneous decisions to deliberation. So when you are acting spontaneously and now you start thinking about what you want to do, what happens is that you actually increase responsibility, but you decrease freedom. So it seems as if when you're acting spontaneously, you're kind of in the middle, but when you start thinking, it has different effects on freedom and responsibility. So they too seem to be somewhat dissociated. Now, the differences between choosing and picking and having consequence and not consequence didn't modulate this. But if you want to kind of summarize this, you'd end up with something like this. So let's say you're in a situation like in the limit experiment, uh, these um, freedom of indifference situations where you have two options and you don't really care, you don't have any strong motives to pick one or the other. Then in these kind of situations, people do feel free um, and they have no problem with saying that when you make a decision like this, you are free. I don't think that kind of this is, re this is that relevant for theoretical arguments, but at least it captures people's lay intuitions and it says that whatever we want to find out about these decisions at this point in time, it might be of interest to lay people to tell them about the way they make their decisions. The second is this kind of scenario. Now, if you're in the uh, reason-based camp of free will, you would presumably say, well, now he's got a good reason to pick the right. So uh, this is a situation where he's more free. There is a reason to pick one or the other or a motive to pick one over the other. Actually, it turns out that lay people don't think that you're free in these kind of situations. They feel that you have to take the money. You can't not take the money. So there's this very interesting situation where people feel almost like compelled or uh, that, that um, a motive or a reason inhibits uh, their freedom rather than giving them freedom. And this is a situation where you could say people are responsible but not free. 
Now, these are all graded ratings. So you could say, well, they were a little bit free because they didn't uh, rate all the way at the baseline of the scale. So there is some, there's some way out, but it's quite clear that you can dissociate these two factors. So to summarize this, um, in the interest of time, I'm keeping this short. So there are cases where people subjectively believe decisions of, uh, are not free. For example, when you don't think about, when you're not consciously kind of aware of your intention before you perform an action. When you deliberate, when you have motives, when you have real options, when they have consequences, and uh, when you kind of think about this ahead of time, as opposed to freedom is uh, when you think about it, in the sense of being aware of your intention, when, you're spon when you act spontaneously, you don't have a motive, you don't have real options, there are no consequences, and you have proximal intention. So I think this is quite interesting because, I mean, obviously, if we think about an organism that was um, uh, defined by the characteristics on the right, this wouldn't presumably be a very sophisticated organism. So an organism that is spontaneous doesn't base their decisions on motivation or options or consequences. Of course, this is a really boring organism. It wouldn't be very successful in the world. Um, but nonetheless, people believe that this kind of scenario is one where you would feel particularly free. So I think this is a kind of dissociation of the subjective experience of freedom in these situations and the ascription of freedom in these situations is something that is not this kind of high blown sense of uh, responsibility and uh, deliberation, et cetera. It's something that is very pedestrian and very basic, very simple, almost like stochastic behavior. And people seem to be, uh, feel quite free in these situations and they ascribe freedom to these situations. But when we have reasons, when we have uh, real options, et cetera, it seems people don't feel subjectively free to override these good reasons. So we kind of come, they all, there's more like a, a compulsive nature of having a good reason. And um, so what does this mean for what well, Walter is gonna talk about in a minute? Well, first of all, I think uh, it's interesting because it uh, says that lay concepts of free will um, seem to not be loaded with um, deliberation, motivation, options, consequences, etc., in the sense of like a reason-based view on free will. So possibly, uh, as we've seen, they can be dissociated, so they can have the effects of certain manipulations can have opposing effects on freedom and on responsibility. So, I mean, my take has always been on this, I would kind of liberate the um, uh, concepts of freedom from all this uh, talk about responsibility, uh, sorry, about so talk about motivation, deliberation, reasons, et cetera, and save that for responsibility and keep the um, uh, 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 term of the freedom term more with the kind of lay intuitive term that I think is also the one that is used by most scientists in the sense of these more or less spontaneous, stochastic, indifferent decisions. Now, I'd like to just finally just say, of course, this doesn't speak to dispositional accounts uh, of reason responsiveness. So even if you, um, uh, I mean, I've been talking to Walter about this and to Till about this, so I'm, I'm not a philosopher, but as far as I understand, the dispositional account is the kind of popular one at the moment. So of course we can't speak to dis dispositions here. And it doesn't speak to the usefulness of technical definitions, but I think it's important to know when you define these terms, so you don't want to be too far away from lay intuitions and certainly not because I've heard a lot of talks that start with, we all know that, or intuitively we know that, make appeal to lay intuitions, and I think that we might be quite wrong about what lay intuitions are. Thanks. All right, thank you, John. Um, now we're gonna open up the floor for one or two questions. Um, I don't see any from our uh, free will group, but there was one from attendees kind of abroad. And the question was very interesting. How much of this do you think is driven by culture? In other words, would people from different countries have different views? Okay, you can see me now, right? Not the slides, is that correct? Yeah. Correct. Okay, good. So uh, we haven't done culture studies on this specifically, uh, but we have some more work on opinion polls, which of course, fancy speaking, you want to call experimental philosophy, but I just call it opinion polls. Um, and uh, what we found is actually striking similarity in a lot of free will beliefs across cultures. I mean, there are small differences, but we, for example, looked at um, belief in free will in Singapore, USA, and Germany, and the large majority of people believe in free will, 
and there are small differences, but the overwhelming majority of people believe in free will, uh, and the overwhelming people, the majority of people are dualists as well. So um, uh, I know there are cultural effects, and we chose these cultures because they were quite on opposite um, uh, extremes of the kind of collectivism uh, uh, scales. But uh, it seems that um, they're not that different when it comes to these other judgments. But for this, we haven't done the study yet. Okay, thank you. And then one more question. Um, Mark asked his question first. So Mark, if you'd like to unmute yourself and then you can um, ask your question. It looks like perhaps he, okay. oh, there you are. <laughs> All right, sorry. Um, okay, uh, so just a couple of things. One is um, uh, I was thinking that the deliberation versus spontaneous, it seems like there's two different, um, two different variables there. One is like whether you deliberate, it's like whether you think about it in advance. Um, or just decide as soon as the options are presented. But a second thing is whether at the moment of choice, you feel like you've got good reasons for one over the other. And those can come apart. Like you could instantaneously feel like, oh, A, option A is better than option B and do that. And that feels reason space. But also you could deliberate for a long time and just still come to like, geez, I don't know what to do and I have to decide now. So I, I feel like it would be good to separate those two things out. And the second thing is, um, I think it's important when you like the, the, the things, the, the cases you gave, there were two separate options, but the, per, the, you know, the person's like born about what to do, but in the Libet case, the two options are like identical. So it's like, it's analogous to like going to the store and there's two cans of the exact same tomato soup on the shelf and you just randomly pick one as opposed to two separate different things and you're not sure and you pick. And it seems like the Libet case is this like pure Buridan case where you're just picking between two identical things. And the cases that you were looking at in the study are more like, you're not really sure which is better, but they're different things and you might care about. So you might care about that kind of decision in a different way. That's it. Yeah, thanks. Um, I realized that this presentation was very quick and I went over this in quite some speed. So, um, uh, so just as a point, I agree that the temporal aspect and the, I'd say, justification aspect are two different ones. Um, but uh, the idea of the temporal aspect was captured by the uh, question of distal versus proximal. Um, so I'd say um, that uh, the uh, distal intentions basically for the freedom rating don't play any role as long as they, I mean, the, the key question there is the uh, proximal cause. The distal cause doesn't play a role. So basically if a proximal cause flows through, uh, a distal cause through, flows through a proximal cause, then that's all fine. If it influences a pro proximal cause, then it will have the predicted effects. But if it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So the, the, the proximal decision seems to be what affects people's freedom rating. Um, and the second point is, um, uh, as you mentioned, you see two soup cans uh, in the supermarket. That's exactly the situation that we had uh, when we compared picking versus choosing. Um, now, it wasn't a supermarket, it wasn't soup cans, but it was two job contracts that had the same conditions. So um, for all purposes um, of our study, um, the uh, subject wasn't informed of any differences between the options. Of course, they can speculate that there might be differences, um, but we didn't have any differences between these conditions. And that's exactly to, 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 to identify this picking versus choosing manipulation. I think that goes exactly down those lines. And what turns out is that people, when they're standing in front of, I mean, that would be what you would extrapolate from this is you'd say, well, if you go in a supermarket and there are two soup cans and they're exactly the same and you don't care if you pick left or right and they're the same size, everything is the same about them, then you feel free to pick one or the other. You feel more free than when there is a reason to pick one. If there one is a, has a dent and it looks a little bit off and the other one doesn't, you're going to pick the good one, but you don't want to pick the other one and you won't feel free to pick the other one as much as you would in the indifferent case. So I think we've looked at that actually in these studies. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so with the interest of time, we will um, turn the floor over to Walter for, um, for his discussion. Uh, can you see my slides now? No. I can see you. Uh oh, let me, oh, I know what I did. I forgot to share a screen, there you go. Now? Yep. Cool. Good. So I'm not going to disagree with John very much at all about any of this because he and I are on the same side. It's not really a debate. It's a conversation. It's a discussion. What I'm going to instead do is try to draw out some of the, what I take to be the philosophical lessons of some of this work uh, that he's been doing. Uh, and I want to start by just reminding everybody of what the kind of basic challenge uh, really is. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the challenge from determinism. There are other challenges, other considerations, uh, bypassing sourcehood and so on. Uh, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm gonna focus on this one. And it starts uh, with, and what I'm gonna do is lay out an argument. I'm not endorsing this argument. I'm just saying this is the argument that creates the challenge. Um, starts out with the premise that every act is either determined or random. Uh, the reason you put random in there is there might be probabilistic causes where it doesn't actually determine that it happens, but you have no control over which of the possibilities uh, actually gets uh, instantiated or actualized. Uh, then it's random in that sense. Um, an agent who is, whose act is determined um, is not free. Notice we're talking about agents being free, not acts being free. It could be easily reformulated the other way, but you'll see later why we, I want to do it this way. Uh, any agent whose act is uh, random uh, is not free because if they have no control over which of the many possibilities is actualized, there's a probability, but they don't determine that probability. It's some quantum event maybe. Uh, then they're not free to do one thing or the other. It's just random what happens. Uh, so uh, it follows from one, two, and three that no agent is ever free. Uh, so the next premise, an agent who's not free is not responsible. People think responsibility requires freedom, which is the contrapositive of that. Um, we're talking here about responsibility in the sense of accountability or liability to anger or punishment, something like that. We're not talking about attributability or answerability for those philosophers who know those uh, notions. Therefore, no agent is ever responsible. <clears throat> uh, follows again from four and five. Then we should never punish any agent who is not responsible. Now let me emphasize here, we're talking about punishment in the sense of putting someone in prison uh, for an act that they committed or publicly condemning them for an act that they committed, uh, blaming them, something like that. We're not talking about necessarily that it's based on their desert or responsibility. If you, if you put somebody in prison uh, for the act that they committed and you go, but we're not doing it you know, because you're responsible because you deserve it, we're just doing it as a kind of quarantine so it's not really punishment. Uh, I take that to be just plain with language. Uh, you're still putting them in prison. Uh, and so um, we don't think you should put people in prison, find them guilty in, in a court and put them in prison uh, for an act if they weren't responsible for it. For example, if it was a reasonable mistake or somebody forced them to do it, something like that. Therefore, it follows from six and seven, we should never punish any agent. And that includes murderers and rapists. We should not be punishing them in the sense of putting them in prison for what they did. Uh, and so uh, I think almost nobody wants to accept uh, that conclusion. There might be some, you can never say never, but almost nobody wants to accept uh, conclusion eight. The problem is that eight follows from the ones that came before. Uh, and so in order to avoid eight, you gotta deny one of the earlier premises. And different theorists deny different premises. Libertarians uh, who are incompatibilists, that is they think 
freedom and determinism are incompatible. We're talking here about freedom, okay? They deny premise one. So they say, no, some acts are neither determined nor random. They're, they're based on the agent or the agent's reasons or something like that, but those are not causes, so it's not determined and it's not random because there's a reason for it. Uh, so they deny premise one. Other theorists are, who are compatibilists in the sense that they think freedom and determinism are compatible, well, they deny premise two because they think you can be determined and yet still free. That's compatible. Uh, and others are hard determinists. They're incompatibilists like the libertarians, but they think determinism is true, uh, so, they can, so they reach conclusion um, uh, four and six, um, but they deny premise seven. They say, well, even though the person's not responsible and they don't deserve it, sometimes you have to put people in prison. Maybe not for the same reason, but you're still putting them in prison for what they did. So notice different traditional philosophical views have denied premise one, premise three, and premise seven. The, um, some people have, have questioned premise three, but I'm gonna focus on premise five. They all seem to take that one for granted. Um, and so it's the semi-compatibilists, which I think John is one, uh, but many other people as well. Um, semi-compatibilists are the ones that question that. So there are two versions of semi-compatibilism, a strong and a weak version. The strong version actually accepts premises one, two, three, and the conclusion four. So they agree that no agent's ever free, but they say they're responsible anyway. John Fisher in the upper right there is more subtle uh, or, I don't know, he doesn't, he doesn't come out in favor of that conclusion. He says, I don't know, I'm gonna re remain agnostic about that, but I am going to deny premise five. So I'm gonna say, even if that's true, it's not gonna yield a conclusion that no agent is ever responsible. So the semi-compatibilist view, I'm gonna take to be the strong version, that's what I'm gonna talk about, where you say the agents are not free, uh, but they still are responsible. To make that coherent, you have to deny premise five, which says that any agent who is not free is not responsible, or the contrapositive responsibility requires freedom. You can't be responsible without being free. Any of those formulations is going to be equivalent. The question is, why deny premise five? You can't just go, oh, I'm going to give that one up. You got to say something about why. Okay, so we're going to look at arguments against it. Well, I, I guess I should add here, you know, a lot of people just say, well, it's obvious, you know, and they don't give any argument for it. Uh, look, you know, it, it might be obvious to some people, uh, but it's not obvious, uh, but we'll see whether it's obvious to everyone. I just want to say there are not a lot of arguments in the literature that I know of in the answer, question and answer thing, uh, session, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know of any really strong arguments for premise five. People just kind of take it for granted. Um, and when you think about the notions that are involved, I think there's reason to be kind of dubious about it. Uh, freedom, I take it, uh, and this comes from uh, Mike Gazzaniga, but also I think it's implicit in some of Strawson's uh, discussion in Freedom and Resentment. Freedom is a metaphysical notion. Maybe it's a scientific notion, but it's not normative the way responsibility is. To say that someone's responsible is to say they are liable to punishment or rebuke uh, or anger. Uh, and so that's a normative question about what they're liable to, what it would, what people ought, how the people ought not to respond to them, how they ought to respond to them very different from the metaphysical. So it'd be kind of surprising if they had the strong relationship that's claimed uh, in premise five. Uh, I wanna point out also that freedom is intrapersonal in the sense that whether you're free depends on what's going on in your head uh, when you act. Uh, it does depend on other people, but only in so far as those other people are affecting what's going on in your head. Whereas responsibility is in some cases interpersonal uh, whether you're negligent or not is often dependent on what other people around you are doing, which shows what is reasonable for you to do or to assume. So when you think about the two notions, I think premise five would be kind of surprising. That doesn't show it's false, but it shows it's surprising. 
furthermore, I'm going to look at uh, popular opinions, uh, lay people's judgments or common judgments uh, of the folk that are expressed in surveys. Let me say right from the start, I do not think that surveys yield philosophical truth. That's not the point here. The point is, if a lot of people who are using this notion disagree with premise five, then at least it's not so obvious that it doesn't need an argument. Uh, and then if there's no argument, it's in trouble. Uh, but all the surveys do is they suggest uh, the need for uh, stronger support. They don't show uh, that the premise is false, okay? Now, John already mentioned this study, uh, so I won't um, dwell on it, um, but we did get a main effect of responsibility being higher than judgment. But as he said, that's just meaningless because there are different scales. Uh, it was different groups of people. It was a between subjects experiment. So what we need, and also it was a, a fairly limited uh, sample of different groups. Um, the, you know, as brought out by the culture question. So I'm gonna focus instead on a much larger survey. It was actually 5,000 people spanning 20 countries and 16 languages and asked uh, people questions, not only about freedom, but about responsibility or at least blameworthiness and punishment. They're surrogates for responsibility um, in, uh, in this survey. Just came out last year. Uh, and what the, I'm gonna, uh, come back to the other scenario, but in one of their scenarios that run like this. Imagine a universe in which everything that happens is completely brought about by whatever happened before it. Uh, and then they expand on that to make sure that people understand. So if everything was exactly the same, John would have made his decision. What was it to eat vegetable soup at lunch? It had to happen. And then they add, uh, following um, Nichols and Nob. In this universe, a man named Bill had become attracted to his secretary, and he decides that the only way to be with her is to kill his wife and three children. Before he leaves on a business trip, he sets up a bomb that destroys his house and kills his family while he's away. Uh, so that's the scenario they're asked, and they're asked these four questions in the lower left. Did he do it freely? How much control did he have? How blameworthy? Uh, how much punishment uh, did he deserve? Okay. Uh, here are the results. I've circled the relevant ones for our purposes. Uh, freedom, 0.47. It may look pretty small, but it's below the midpoint of 0.5 because that scale was zero to one. I hate the fact that they did the first one zero to one and the others one to seven. But, but anyway, that's what they did. So um, it's significantly below the midpoint. Control is below the midpoint, but the two responsibility stand-ins, blame and, and desert for punishment are above, significantly above the midpoint, 467504. So it looks like there must be um, many people in their uh, survey who are ascribing responsibility without freedom. Not all, of course, it's not uniform, it's just slightly below the midpoint, but Still, it's well below the others, so there must have been a significant group there that's willing to say they're responsible but not free. Okay. Uh, there are, of course, objections. Uh, one is that they're just confused. You know, they don't know what they're talking about uh, because the relevant kind of freedom is just defined as whatever is needed for responsibility when other necessary conditions are met. This is the kind of line that Susan Wolf takes. Um, so premise five then just comes out true by definition. Well, philosophers can define their terms any way they want. Uh, the point of the surveys is that that's not what ordinary folk mean by freedom. So if you want to talk with them and not misunderstand each other, uh, you might not want to use that definition of freedom because that doesn't seem to be what they're talking about. Uh, and even if some philosophers and some ordinary folk do mean that by freedom, so it is true by depth, so five comes out true by definition, it might not be the only kind of freedom. My main move in this, uh, in this uh, dialectic is to, to say, maybe there are just two kinds of freedom. And we're talking about different kinds of freedom and different subjects in the experiments are talking about different kinds of freedom. And here's how I explain the difference following on Fred Dretzky, my former colleague in the upper left, and Joel Feinberg, 
uh, someone who I admired from a distance for many, many years in the upper right. Uh, let's ask what freedom means. If we want to get different notions of freedom, what do we mean by that? Well, free coffee. Coffee's free when it doesn't cost anything. So there's a certain barrier, cost, that doesn't stop you from getting coffee. Free seats. Well, is this seat free in the restaurant? Well, that depends on whether somebody's reserved the table or not. Uh, and if they haven't, then it's free. So again, the barrier is a reservation. Free speech. Well, are there laws against burning flags as has become uh, a topic in the news recently? Um, and the answer is no, then you have free speech. But if there's a law against it, then there is a barrier to at least that form of speech. So notice they have very different barriers. Cost, reservations, laws. Uh, but freedom is always freedom from some kind of barrier or other. And that barrier determines what you're free to do instead of something else. Because different barriers point to different things you're free to do. Uh, you might, if you have two cars, you might be free to use one car or another. If you, um, if you are in prison, uh, you don't have freedom to leave your cell, but you do have freedom to walk around in your cell. If you get out of prison, uh, if you get out of your cell because it's, you know, kind of yard time, then you can walk around the prison, but you can't leave the prison. If you're released from prison and put on house arrest, you can leave the prison, but you can't leave your house. If you are out on bail, you can... You can't leave the city. If you don't have a passport, you can't leave the country. So each type of barrier sets a certain limit to the things you are free to do or, or not free to do. The ones that are relevant to us in the discussion regarding determinism uh, are freedom from causation and freedom from constraint. I'm going to sometimes talk about causation, others determination. Uh, the difference is you might have probabilistic causation of certain sorts. Um, but and I'm going to talk about constraint or excuse because I think the relevant kinds of constraints are the ones that uh, excuse or reduce responsibility. Um, but we can talk about that more if you want in the discussion. I just want to give some examples to make sure we have the discussion, uh, the distinction straight. There's some acts that are both caused and also constrained, uh, such as if somebody trips you when you're playing basketball in the upper right, uh, then you lose the ball. Well, you're not, you didn't freely, you know, give the ball to the other team. You're not responsible for giving the ball to the other team because you were caused by the tripping and you were constrained in the sense that you didn't get what you wanted, which was to dribble down the court and score for your team. Uh, phobias like the spider in the, in the right, you know, you, someone might not be free to, get the spiders out of the garage because they're too scared to go in there with all those spiders. Uh, they are caused by that and they are also constrained because they want to clear all the spiders out of the garage, but they can't. Uh, and the same for mistakes. I might, you know, I might want to, um, I don't know, to serve a meal that my guest will like and I know that they're allergic to peanuts, but I don't know there's peanuts in the salad dressing that I give them. Uh, then I am constrained by my ignorance um, because I can't do what I want to do. Um, but there are other acts that are caused but not constrained. Uh, suppose that I uh, am the best man at your wedding and I'm supposed to bring the ring, but an hour before the wedding, I notice that my favorite basketball team is playing uh, or I just decide I want to go for a walk uh, and I just blow off the promise and blow off the wedding. Why? Because I'd rather watch the basketball game or go for the walk. Uh, well, my act is caused. It's caused by my desire to go for a walk and also by my lack of concern for you. But it's not constrained in any relevant sense that would provide any excuse whatsoever. It's still my fault that I don't bring the ring to the wedding and, just, and, and ruin the wedding for you. Uh, I just added this for completeness. There also might be acts that are neither caused nor constrained or constrained but not caused. But the ones that are important for our distinction are the ones up above. The ones that are caused but not constrained. Those are the ones that are going to be relevant. So the point is once you get this distinction between freedom from causation and freedom from excuse, um, then you see an equivocation in the original argument that created the challenge. 
Remember the premises. Premise two was an agent whose acts is determined is not free. And premise five was any agent who's not free is not responsible. They both use the term freedom. So we got to ask, what kind of freedom? What kind of freedom are we talking about here? Well, if we're talking about freedom from causation, then premise two is true because if it's determined, it, it is caused, so it's not free from causation. But it's not at all obvious. I think it's false uh, that an agent who's not free is responsible because as the wedding example showed, you know, you can be caused and therefore not free from causation. You can be caused to go for a walk instead of the wedding, but you're still responsible because the kind of cause that made you do it does not remove your responsibility. It's no excuse. Freedom from constraint, however, in contrast, makes true premise five. If you are not free from constraint, then you are constrained and then you're not responsible. It's not your fault if somebody tripped you, right? But premise two is now the one that's it's no good because any act, agent whose act is determined is not free from constraint. Well, that's the wedding example shows that's false, right? If you're going along with me on that example. So um, it looks like there's no single notion of freedom that makes both premises true and that's the sign of unequivocation. So determinism excludes freedom from causation, but it does not exclude freedom from constraint and hence, it does not exclude uh, responsibility. Uh, this position I call contrastive semi-semi incompatibilism, which is a horrible name. Uh, and so I'm thinking of calling it instead the appeasement view, because the idea is it tries to give a little bit to both sides, or as Hannah Montana and Miley Cyrus would say, it gets you the best of both worlds. Uh, that was their tour name. So. Uh, contrast, I'm not a fan, by the way. I just thought it was a cool poster. Uh, contrastivists agree with incompatibilists about freedom from causation. And they also agree with compatibilists about freedom from constraint because they think that freedom from causation is incompatible with determinism, but freedom from constraint is compatible with determinism. But they disagree with incompatibilists about freedom from constraint. And they disagree with compatibilists about freedom from causation, because they think that freedom from constraint is compatible with determinism and freedom from causation is not. So they're a giving part to each side is what they're doing. And what about premise five? Well, they agree that premise five is true if it's about freedom from constraint, but not if it's about freedom from causation. So the point is a lot of the previous discussion has been confusing these two kinds of freedom, and therefore the conversation has been confused. Now, that is obviously a, a complex philosophical view. Uh, let's look at what the folk mean. How do we know what the folk mean by free? Well, let's go back to our survey. This time it's a kind of Harry Frankfurt type um, uh, example where there's a counterfactual intervener uh, same survey, 5,000 people, 20 countries, 16 languages, and so on. Uh, you're projecting into the future, uh, but in your own world. And the mad scientists have a sophisticated device that monitors what's going on in somebody's mind and can change what they think and choose and do uh, at the last second if they, if they can predict that the person's not going to uh, make the decision they want. Uh, and what they want is for Martin to kill Adam. So they monitor Martin. And if he even starts to decide not to kill Adam, then they're going to intervene and make sure he does kill Adam. But in fact, Martin decides all on his own to kill Adam and ends up killing Adam. And the scientists don't have to interfere at all. Now, notice in this scenario, Martin is not free to do otherwise because if he starts to, to do something of, to do otherwise, the, they will intervene and he will do that. So it looks like he does not have the ability uh, to do otherwise. That's going to be controversial. We can talk about it. But on that interpretation, then it might be surprising that they actually found that people said, oh, yeah, Martin's free. Oh, yeah, Martin's in control. 
So 0.83 out of, you know, on a zero to one scale and five on a zero to seven, or sorry, on a one to seven scale, both significantly above the, the midline, it looks like they're ascribing freedom when he can't do otherwise. Now, I remember find that pretty surprising, and I think a lot of people might find it surprising, but we gotta figure out what they mean by this, okay? Now we're gonna go back to con the contrasts and contrastivism, my favorite ism. Uh, some scenarios ask just this abstract question like Roski's and Nichols and a bunch of uh, Namias and, and um, studies. And to determine universe, is anyone free, okay? Others ask concrete questions. In a determined universe, is this murderer, Bill in the first scenario, Martin in the counterfactual intervener scenario, is this particular murderer free? Now notice, you, you know, folk tend to answer yes, uh, I'm sorry, no to the abstract question more often than to the concrete question. It would be a better way to put that. And there are lots of explanations, emotion, uh, and concreteness, intrusion of power beliefs. But I'm gonna, this is a complementary uh, explanation that I think explains some of the variants, but I'm, it doesn't replace those others, okay? I wanna suggest that the abstract question leads many participants to think about causation as the contrast. Why? Because it says it's a determined universe, and it doesn't mention any particular agent or, excuse, or situation uh, or action that you could excuse. And so that just doesn't come up because it's not mentioned in the question. But, um, when, uh, but it does mention causation. So you're thinking now people who, who get that question are more likely to think of freedom from causation. Whereas the concrete question mentions a particular murderer in a particular situation and now it becomes relevant to ask, is that agent to blame? Uh, do they have any excuse? Are they free from constraint? All of those things become relevant so people are more likely to think of freedom from constraint. Uh, and if the folk, um, and then the folk, you know, they're not all gonna do it the same way, uh, but if they change the contrast, then the ones who say, yes, they're free, uh, are gonna be thinking about freedom from constraint. The ones that say, no, they're not free are gonna be thinking about freedom from causation. And the percentages of people that give the different answers can vary depending on the question uh, that was asked. Uh, notice the questions only influence the percentages of subjects who give the answer. They don't guarantee uniform answers by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I think that's an interesting question that often is overlooked in these studies. You know, you go, well, you know, this factor changed it from 40% to 60%. Yeah, but what about the other people that didn't give the answer? You know, why are they giving the ones they did? This is what I'm trying to explain uh, in terms of the relevant contrast. So my conclusions are that determinism is not compatible with freedom from causation, but it is compatible with freedom from constraint and responsibility does not require freedom from causation, but it does require freedom from constraint. Um, now, uh, and so the, what that shows is that the contrast, what it's freedom from, really makes a big difference in this debate. And we have to get it clear and ask ourselves which kind of freedom we're talking about, or we're just going to talk, you know, we're going to miss each other and talk past each other. Uh, in terms of the folk, I think we need better experiments. I would not say that that experiment I cited uh, settles the issue yet. Uh, we're planning, John and I and, and some others are planning uh, a series of experiments to test these hypotheses about which contrast people have in mind. And I would welcome any suggestions about how to test those hypotheses about the folk notion. Um, and I look forward uh, to your questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Walter. Um, we have two Walter specific questions um, and then I will open it up to a general question and answer. We have kind of a long list um, that has been accumulating. It's really exciting to see. So the first question comes from one of our attendees. I um, will unmute you now, allow to talk. 
Okay, so um, Catalin or Catalin, sorry if I mispronounce your name, um, you should be permitted to talk and you can go ahead and uh, ask your question. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Walter, for your, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a quick question. So you started this argument by um, outlining this eight uh, step logical argument. And uh, I wanted to ask you if you can comment on, on, on step eight in particular. And the, the question I had for you is, um, the idea of whether punishment is 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 okay uh, in in a progressive uh, what I was saying what I said in the chat is that a progressive legal position on punishing is that punishment should be not uh, should be primarily reformative not punitive and, and of course we know if we look at legal uh, modern legal theory that sentencing has all these components to it and one of them is you know uh, uh, can deal with aggravated uh, types of components where somebody really did something exceptionally bad and and then there's and a kind of punitive component gets added to the uh, sentencing about incarceration. Uh, but there, there's usually more, more than one goal in sentencing, and, and again, an ideal society where you have, uh, where you think of punishment or incarceration as a type of social surgery where you're, physic, you're, you're, you're fixing some kind of uh, a, a biological system that, and I, obviously it's not just my argument, others have made it, uh, and whether this makes the premise a number eight uh, a bit more digestible or a bit more okay, uh, uh, and maybe your comments on that, and whether we really uh, could also uh, start the argument there. Sure, thanks for your question. I mean, um, I don't really disagree with any of that, but I have a lot to say about it. Uh, part, uh, part of the point of punishment is uh, rehabilitation, sure. Uh, part of the point of putting them in prison is so that we can require them to take certain rehabilitative programs or at least reward them with perhaps early release if they do. Uh, but that is not the whole purpose. I mean, one reason that I want rapists put in jail is so they won't rape people. And one reason I want murderers put in prison is so that they won't uh, murder people. Uh, so it's also prevention uh, of those people from committing uh, other crimes. So we want to distinguish the, the whole set of forward-looking crime prevention goals from the backward-looking retributive goals. Uh, and I tried to make it clear, and when I was talking about punishment, I was saying, I was talking about putting them in prison for the act that they committed, not, you know, retribu retribution for its own sake, but instead, what are you gonna do when somebody's found guilty of rape? Well, you don't want them running in the streets, and so, because you wanna prevent them from raping other people, um, you do want to rehabilitate them, sure, if there's some way to do that, if you can figure out how. It almost never works, but suppose you are, you know, you find out some way to do it, then yeah, you want to do that. But in the meantime, while you're rehabilitating them, they're in prison. That's what I mean by punishment. And I think that even hard determinants don't deny that you might have to constrain someone in a prison, uh, in some cases, such as rape and murder, uh, for the sake of prevention and rehabilitation, uh, what they're saying is you're not doing that for merely for retribution, to get them back for what they did in the past. You're doing it instead to make the future better. And I agree, I'm just saying that's punishment too, and they don't deny that kind of punishment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then one more Walter specific question right now, which uh, will come from Liad. Yes, thank you, Walter. Uh, I wanted to ask about the, the meaning of constraint because um, I could think of a, of a case where someone commits a crime and then we realize that person has a brain tumor and uh, when we take the brain tumor out, we, he doesn't have, I think the example was pedophile um, uh, intentions or what have you. Uh, and then we say, well, it's not his fault. The, the tumor was a constraint. He shouldn't be held responsible. But I can guarantee you, even without looking at his brain, that if I look at you know Charles Manson's brain, it's also it, it doesn't have cancer, but it's probably not a normal brain. So something went wrong there as well. So would you call that a constraint? Like, could your own brain be a constraint that exempts you from responsibility? Uh, it could be in some cases, uh, such as the case of the tumor that made someone a pedophile, that person said, 
I know that's the wrong thing to do. I wish I didn't do it. And I wish I didn't even want to do it. Uh, and so that person is getting constrained. They're not doing the things that they really want to do in their lives. A more difficult question. So Charles Manson would be an interesting example because, you know, if he's schizophrenic, as some people claim, then that usually develops in late teens and it wasn't part of his personality before that. Well, I don't know, because I haven't seen Charles Manson's brains, but we have looked at the brains of some people, namely psychopaths in prisons, and they're often born that way. Then you kind of can't say that's against their own desire, okay? So now, the, the more general question, apart from those particular cases, is how do you tell when it's a constraint as opposed to, well, oh, it's just what they want to do. Exactly. Uh, and there are a number of different philosophical theories about that. And I'd rather at this point, at least maintain, remain neutral. Some people think, well, it's a constraint when it does not mesh with your deep self in the right way. Other people says, you know, well, it's gonna be a constraint when it's not reasons responsive. Uh, so it keeps you from doing what you, you know, recognize are the reasons to act a certain way. Uh, I think what, all I need here is that there's some people who are, you know, caused but still constrained. And, uh, and so what are the constraints? Well, when it's both not reasons responsive and also doesn't mesh with your deep self, those are going to be the cases that I think are going to be clear uh, for the claim that I was making, which is that causation and constraint are different notions because sometimes there's a cause, like in the wedding that I mentioned, the person is still reasons responsive. Yes, that desire comes from their deep self. They don't care about their friend. They want to go for a walk. It's all meshing perfectly well, and they're endorsing that. Then there are going to be clear cases, although there's a lot of disagreement about exactly how to draw the line uh, in the middle. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Um, now we're gonna be starting the general question and answer session. I um, will hopefully get to as many questions as possible. And the first uh, question comes from one of our attendees, Eddie, thank you for your patience. Um, I have now allowed you to talk. Hi, Eddie. Hey, I don't, can, I'm, I'm gonna assume you can hear me unless someone tells me otherwise. Uh, we can hear you. I, uh, I wish we were all in California or something better than this, uh, but nice to see at least some of you. Uh, just, for the, <laughs> just for the organizers, uh, those people like me outside, unless there's something about my Zoom setting, I can't see who is actually attending. So if there's, it'd be cool to see who else is here. But anyway, um, my uh, question is really for John, um, but it kind of relates, I thought Walter would, would hit on it a little more directly. Um, John knows this because I bugged him about it a year ago at the conference, but the, the text of the questions in those studies is how free was the action? Um, and I, I predict, although I'm not positive, that people will interpret that differently from a question that uh, focuses more on acting of one's own free will or even making a free choice or a free decision. Um, and I suspect people will think things like deliberation or having reasons uh, or perhaps some of the other things that were tested will not come out quite the same if, if the question were asked a little differently. And that may relate a little bit to Walter's argument because um, to the extent people are just asked how free something is, they really are primed to think in terms of freedom from constraint uh, or something that's, you know, constraining them from having multiple options. Whereas if they're thinking in terms of free will, perhaps to the extent people have that concept in their head, they may be tight, uh, tying it more closely to moral responsibility. And uh, Walter and others, if uh, I'll just end by saying, if you haven't seen the new monist uh, with the paper by David Lewis uh, or the abstract or the outline by David Lewis and then commentary by Bibi and others, um, it's it's right up your alley because he's trying to give a compatibilist analysis of ability in terms of uh, freedom from constraint. 
Thanks. Good to see everybody, kind of. Yeah, so the answer to that question is very easy. Um, I experienced the following. When we did these studies on uh, freedom ratings, uh, as you just mentioned about for the actions described in the vignettes, uh, I spoke to a lot of compatibilist philosophers ahead of time, and many of them said, yeah, yeah, people are going to rate these uh, deliberative um, decisions uh, where you have reasons, um, um, uh, different alternatives, etc. They're going to rate them as more free than the others. Um, and they were quite surprised that actually quite the opposite came out. Um, and that lay people seem to judge these limit type of kind of more or less indifferent decisions as very free. So, um, I think our intuition can fail us uh, when it comes to how people judge freedom. And I think there's almost like a sense that the more time we professionally spend with these topics, the more we confuse our theories with the actual true state of affairs of what lay people believe. So um, I'd say uh, we just need to do more studies and um, I think of uh, this research field as a shopping center or a shopping mall. And I'd say the studies, we've cleaned two, two rooms in that shopping mall and you could still debate about what's going on there, but there are many other spaces to clean up. Um, and I think that just needs to be done. I, I find it very difficult um, to predict what the outcome and these kind of lay ratings is going to be. Um, so I think we just have to do the work. And Walter just mentioned another study, and you've done many studies uh, on related topics. I just think we just have to do, do, do the studies. For example, I would have never thought that um, my current belief is that the reason people um, uh, believe in free will is not because they're compatible, it's because they're just absolutely severe, massive, unteachable dualists. And uh, we keep talking about compatibilism, but I think actually it doesn't, it's got not, compatibilism is, is, is on the wrong topic. It's about why would you think that free will is compatible with determinism? Well, lay people think determinism holds in the real world. That's all fine, but I've got my mind. There's something separate and it has its own laws. Uh, and so I'm, I, I have free will in my, in my mind, in my dualistic, uh, um, uh, substance dualistic mind. So. I mean, I, I'd, I'd, I'd say, I mean, um, I know that you are interested in this as well, but I think we, we kind of, we pre-structure these debates in some way. And I think if you look at the data, you can often be surprised. And I think we might want to collect some more data at this point. Yep, more data is always good. Yeah, Thanks. so I, I certainly agree with that. I agree that more data is going to be good. Uh, but you got to design the experiments carefully to figure out exactly what the different factors are, too. Uh, um, well, only thing I wanted to say in response to Eddie is this, I totally agree that whether you ask, is the agent free? Um, is the act free? Is the will free uh, in a variety of circumstances? Which question you're asking can affect the percentages of people who give the answer. But what I want to understand is why are the ones who are on one side, you know, disagree with the ones on the other side. And one explanation of those trends might be the tendency to make them think in terms of contrast. So in addition to just looking at what affects the answers, uh, you know, the percentage of people who give a certain answer, uh, I want to know, like, what about the people who don't change? Why are they still thinking that way? What about on both sides? Uh, Cause it's not going to be everybody who is affected by uh, the form of the question. Uh, and I wish more studies were done to try to answer that question. But I'd, I'd just like to follow up on that just very briefly because um, that might be a point where we disagree slightly. Um, we collected a couple of these data sets and some of them have quite large number of participants. In one case, we had like 600 participants and in other studies we had 2000 participants in related to dualism and free will following Eddie's uh, scales. And we then thought we're gonna look at kind of typologies within these rating spaces. And it's funny enough, it's a continuum. It's just like a big lump of data where some, I mean, 
some people are a little bit more in one direction, some people are a little bit more in another direction. It's very hard to discretize this. And um, when you say, I mean, that's why I earlier on mentioned this little caveat, it depends on where you say, is freedom necessary for responsibility? It depends on where you put up your cutoff on that scale. I, I think it, I mean, if you want to translate this into philosophical positions, you have to discretize a continuous distribution, which is not that, not that easy. Okay, um, well, thank you. And we'll move on to the next question from Patrick. Uh, thanks very much. I really enjoyed the, uh, both of the talks um, and found them extremely stimulating. And I want to come back to this idea of constraint, which I think Liad already mentioned. And uh, I want to play slight uh, devil's advocate and question whether this uh, idea of a constraint uh, is a sufficiently strong theoretical construct to do the work that you, Walter, in particular, seem to want it to do. So th the reason I came to this was um, we did some work uh, recently co on coercion, some experimental work on coercion, um, which is quite interesting. And there are particular, there's particular importance uh, for people serving in the military, uh, where effectively you have to obey orders. That sort of goes with the idea of having a military service. Um, but then when we looked in more detail, it turns out that uh, almost all countries in the world um, say that you have to obey orders, uh, but you're also constrained not to obey orders if the orders are, are illegal or inhuman or whatever. So it looks as though the, the idea, at least in that particular case of coercion, in, in particular social structures, um, you know, there's a constraint which appears to run one way, but then there are uh, um, contrasting or opposing constraints running the other way. And, and then it left me thinking that actually the, word, the concept of constraint wasn't really helping. All that one really needed to say was, if you're a soldier, you do what your officer says. And there's also a similar sense in which the idea of constraint is just really labile. It's just a placeholder for a way of talking about what people are going to do. So there's a nice example in Thomas Hobbes um, of a person who is trying to decide uh, whether to play tennis or not. And I'm just going to read the, um, uh, if I can find the correct part of uh, the correct window in which I uh, got the quote from Hobbes. I worry now that I can't um, immediately find it. Here it is, yeah. Okay, so Hobbes responds that it is no impediment uh, to him that the door to the tennis court is shut until he have a will to play. So it doesn't, he's not constrained by the fact that the tennis court is locked until he's made up his mind that he wants to play tennis, uh, which he hath not till he hath done deliberating whether he shall play or not. So the, the, the door of the tennis court is locked and that's a constraint if he intends to play tennis or if he ends up deciding that he wants to play tennis but otherwise it's not a constraint so it's difficult to say what the fact of the matter is about whether there's a constraint or not and I wonder whether we we just a posteriori define and invent constraints uh, really as a way of talking about whether people could have done otherwise, in which case I'm not sure that the idea actually is a very useful theoretical construct on which to base concepts of responsibility. Uh, well, there's a lot there. So let yes. me just- <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's okay. First of all, about the Hobbes example, uh, I mean, uh, he, you're not constrained from doing something you want to do if you don't want to do it. Um, but is you're still constrained in the sense that even if you changed your mind and wanted to do it, you wouldn't be able to do it. You know, so a, a prisoner in jail who goes, well, I'd rather be here. Uh, they still can't leave, you know, because there are bars on the cell. Uh, and so there's a sense in which they're constrained. There's a sense in which they're not. And I agree with you. The notion is ambiguous. Um, but instead of giving up the notion, I would say, let's explain what we mean by it. Uh, and, and then move forward on that interpretation. With regard to uh, coercion, I think it's important to recognize that in the law, coercion is, is very often seen as a justification, not as an excuse. If somebody says, um, 
you know, if you if your um, commanding officer says to the left march, and you march to the left, um, it's not that you're not responsible for moving to the left. It's that you get praised for moving to the left. It's not that you know you had no say over it. It's not like there was a tumor that was making you go that way. You had a good reason to go left, namely your commanding officer told you to. So the law actually treats justifications different from excuses. Paul Woodruff wrote a wonderful article on this that I can send you if you want. Uh, but there, I think coercion is a, a I, I love your work on coercion, but it's not clear that, uh, you know, in what way that fits into the constraint framework. So what I want to say, the way I want to use the word constraint is that sometimes the causes of our action reduce responsibility or provide a partial excuse. And sometimes they don't. That was the point of the wedding example. That the mere fact that I want to go for a walk instead of bringing the ring to your wedding, uh, that causes me to go for a walk. But that's not in the least reducing my responsibility or you know, my lack of concern for you is not an excuse for not showing up at the wedding. Uh, but it might cause me to not show up at the wedding. So I would say a constraint, you know, one way to count it as a constraint is a constraint is, you know, a cause that does not reduce responsibility or provide even a partial excuse. I'm sorry, a constraint is a cause that does reduce responsibility or provide a partial excuse. Lack of constraint when the cause of your action, because I think there's always a cause, but when the cause of your action is not a constraint in that sense. Now, that leaves open a lot of vagueness about what exactly counts as, you know, you know, as reducing responsibility and providing an excuse and all that. And there I would just plead, hey, I only had 30 minutes. Give me a break. I'll send you an article. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That's a great answer. Okay. Um, and then we next have Tim. Uh, Tim, are you there? Hello, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay, sorry, my fault. All right, so I have a similar question to Eddie's uh, concerning the use of the term free in these survey studies, uh, but I'll, follow, I'll frame my question as a kind of follow up to what John and Walter said in reply to Eddie. Um, I, so I agree with John that what we want to get at is a, uh, a shared pre theoretical concept that ordinary people have. Uh, rather than bias subjects towards uh, some deba debatable uh, theory or explication. Um, but that, you know, that said, what we're interested in is not what lay people associate with the term free, um, but rather what they take the concept of free will to entail. Whatever terms, this is the tricky part, whatever terms people may uh, associate with that concept in their particular ideolect. Um, so I'm doubtful that the unadorned term free really is a good ordinary language proxy for free will, ironically enough, uh, because I think in our culture, the term free has strong associations with spontaneity, maybe even lack of social influence, that sort of thing. Um, and, and free will is a philosophical term of art that's intended to pick out a, a kind of presumed control that people exercise uh, over their own choices. Uh, some kind of, you know, internally generated self-directed control. Um, so it seems to me that when you're framing these studies, the trick is to come up with a way of gesturing at that sort of notion without um, using uh, loaded language um, that might prejudge how people respond to the question, so. Yeah, I, th I think you're uh, fully right. I, I mean, we address these issues as a scientific community and everyone has their own little proto set of theories. And I remember talking to Eddie about the free will inventory and how many different opinions went in there and how it reflected a compromise in the end between different views that people uh, among the authors had, uh, how to structure the problem. So obviously, when we design an empirical study, 
we assume a certain ontology of the domain. We think that people's beliefs are made out of, for example, um, the concept of free or freedom, uh, or that they have a belief about what free will is. They have a concept of free will. And we could say, well, free will is just a theoretical concept. It's been bouncing around the philosophical literature and is sometimes entered neuroscience. So it doesn't, it doesn't really play a role for lay people and we should just leave it out of uh, debates uh, with lay people and public engagement, I'd say, or a discussion about changes in our legal system. We should, as soon as it touches lay people, we should just leave that term out. My experience is quite different. I'd say people have, uh, um, like with free energy, uh, uh, people have strong beliefs about what free will is and they are, it's, it's a little bit, uh, my impression is it's a little bit chaotic, and, um, but they want it because it's free. Um, if, we, if it had a different label, I think they wouldn't care about it. It's like with free energy. People want free energy to be true because it's free and it's energy, so it has to be good. Um, so I, I, think, I, I don't think lay people have that much of a detailed, elaborate concept of free will. Um, so, right, brings us to the question of the ontology. What are the beliefs of these lay people made out of? What kind of concepts are they made out of? And how can we measure this in an unbiased way? I, I don't really see, I don't have a good idea for doing that. I'll be very honest. I think it would have to be data driven. Uh, it's something that's more likely to come out of the text database of Google. Uh, than to come out of any studies either of us is going to design because we have all these prior assumptions about the structure of these belief systems. So I want to agree with that, but I want to say, you know, there could, I'm, the, I'm meant to be suggesting a structure for at least one factor that is going to affect, you know, these consequences that I agree there's not a single well-defined concept of freedom that most lay people have in mind, unless it's a very abstract structure like you know, freedom from the relevant barriers or something like that, which doesn't help you much because uh, you need to know what the barriers are. Uh, but the idea is that there's one concept that they're all thinking of, uh, I think is a mistaken assumption that instead, sometimes they're thinking of freedom from constraint or excuse or whatever you want to call it. And sometimes they're thinking of freedom from causation, but there's not one concept that they are thinking of. Uh, some of them are thinking of one, some are thinking of the other, and some of them vary depending on what the question was. Uh, so I think that's gonna be a more fruitful way of, un, of designing studies and understanding the data than to engage in a search for the folk concept of freedom. Can I, can I just add something here? Um, I think it's important to always remember why we are interested in this kind of a question. What is it that triggers this interest and in this debate in the first place? And you can think of this as like a whatever, uh, you can have a theological debate about free will, uh, a philosophical debate about free will. Uh, you can look at free will from a neuroscientific perspective. But I think when you look at the neuroscientific challenges to free will, I think a lot of this is because people are interested in saying, wow, this is the way we think we make decisions, but actually we make our decisions in a very different way than we think we make them. And I think that is at the heart of this whole topic. And lay, pe lay people have this really fused concept of free will, I think, and it's kind of something got to do with their, got something to do with their decisions. And that's our marker for this uh, um, kind of topic for lay people. But I, I think we should never forget that it's not about the philosophical debates, but there's another side of this, which is telling the public that the way they think they make decisions is simply wrong, no matter whatever we call it. I think that's where you often have these phenomena like neuroscientists going to the media saying we have no free will, we don't make our decisions based on conscious deliberation or whatever. And then you kind of have like a scientific uh, philosophical debate around that. But I think that the, the, the core of scientists finding something out about the way people make decisions and informing the public about the way they make decisions and correcting their mistaken beliefs, that is a big part of what we're doing here, at least from the scientific community, the kind of empirical scientific community.
Okay. Um, well, thank you all. I, um, unfortunately, we are out of time, so I have to go ahead and uh, not take any more questions. Uh, speakers, there have been some really nice questions in the Q&A as well as in the chat, so please reference those um, uh, for feedback on, um, for further feedback on your talk. And for final words, I will um, now tur turn it over to Yuri, who will um, just say final goodbyes. Well, yeah, like every time we do this, it feels like we could go on for hours, which we probably can, uh, but in respecting everybody's time. Uh, thank you very much to uh, all three of you. And I just wanted to say, to remind everyone that actually uh, next week uh, we have uh, two uh, speakers who are external to the consortium who are giving a talk. We have uh, Bill Newsom uh, on July 1st, uh, and then uh, Chandra Sripada on uh, July 3rd. And there's more information. I, I just actually sent the, the link where you can find more information uh, in the Neurophilosophy of Free Will um, um, website under events. And thank you all for attending this talk. We'll again have another one in uh, July. Yes, thank you all. Thanks. Yeah. Great, really nice. Thank you very much.